Paul DeBoli uh, is an assistant professor of political science uh, in uh, Massachusetts. He teaches courses such as the American presidency, American political institutions, the history and the politics of the Cold War. And he has an interest that he will be exploring tonight in what might be the crypto history of John Wilkes Booth next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Already very kind words for Professor Peter Ward. Uh, and uh, thank you, Twitter, at Deacon Punnett. Always nice to keep in touch that way. And uh, and before, and I think this is, you know, this is cool. Actually, we, we kind of crossed paths a little bit. Uh, prior to teaching at LaSalle College, uh, Paul DeBoli had worked uh, as a consultant to several governmental agencies. I didn't do that, uh, but he did work as a campaign aide to Senators John McCain and Lamar Alexander. And I was, I, I met each of those people individually, and I was very fond of them, particularly Lamar Alexander when I was in Tennessee. He was a good governor. Uh, Paul, nice to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, Ian. Uh, I, I I remember standing next to uh, Lamar Alexander once at a concert, and I looked over and I was like, "What? That, that's Lamar Alexander?" I think at that point he was tech Secretary of Education or something like that. But yeah, it was like Bush administration. Uh, yeah, yeah was it was very cool. Yeah. So, okay, this is an unusual paradigm for us here on Coast because I share your interest in this subject, uh, and I. I am. I, I cut my teeth on books about the crypto histories of people like John Dillinger. Was he really shot outside the Biograph Theater? A book that was written by uh, J. Robert Nash and and several other books about you know maybe Billy the Kid or um, you know. Uh, uh, about uh, about various members of the old west that actually did live to lo you know long healthy lives and you get a feel for what's legend and what can ever be verified Wh where are you how does this uh, this exploration of john wilkes booth fit into your uh, interests and and biography as i read them well, I, I have to tell you, and I'm, and I'm really not sure how the heck this happened, but I have been an assassination buff since, heck, I was eight years old. Okay. Um, and I remember, and, and I'm just a little bit older than you, but I remember sitting on my living room floor um, watching my mother and father cry, which apparently was, I mean, I was only, you know, four years old. Right. It was apparently the JFK assassination, and it, and it just, it struck me as very moving. And then, you know, as I got older and I went through, uh, you know, through elementary school and, and secondary school, just some of, even to a, you know, to a 10 or a 12 year old, some things that they were telling me about the JFK assassination just did not make sense. Right. So I kind of, I kind of immersed myself in that. And of course I was, I remember the Bobby Kennedy assassination a lot more, right. um, uh, you know, present in my memory, you know, than JFK because of the age difference. And when, when, when you, when you talk about, government in general there are a lot of things that just don't make sense and um, you know in political science for example well if you back up to physical science we all did those experiments in high school where we alter one variable and just observe how physical systems react whether it's chemistry or physics or whatever well political science seeks to do the same thing in that it takes some event usually a horrible event whether it's Pearl Harbor or whether it's the JFK assassination or whether it's the uh, or 9-11 and you examine how our political systems respond to those stresses. And it gives you a nice picture as to the nature and function of government, how it works, how it's designed to work, the fact that it's, it's, it's populated by human beings who by their very nature are flawed, uh, which leads them to make bad decisions. And sometimes those bad decisions can, be, can have just monumental effects you know, further down the road. Um, <clears throat> the Watergate... Uh, break as a prime example. If you look at most of the people that were, um, you know, in, uh, involved, tried, uh, uh, charged with crimes, right? At the Watergate, a disproportionately large number of those were attorneys, which yeah. basically led the ABA to a series of reforms in the mid '70s, so that now, before you can even apply to take the bar examination in your state, you have to sit and pass a legal ethics examination. 
Um, and that's, uh, again, a, a change that was kind of forced on the system because of, of bad decisions, because of stress, um, you know, that was applied to the system in, in terms of Watergate. So, now, this is very interesting. And I, so I, I share some of those memories. I remember being uh, on my grandmother's lap uh, when the case on came down, um, you know, the promenade in Washington. I remember being sent home from a birthday party when MLK was assassinated. Um, and I, you know, these were, that was a period of time where the idea of assassination and certainly assassinating prominent political figures, social political figures, was a, was the, was a, it's like a daily reality, right? I mean, it's, it felt like that could happen at any second. But what's interesting about uh, about Abraham Lincoln and John Wilkes Booth is that was in and of itself kind of an anomaly. That was part, I mean, the uh, accessibility that Abraham Lincoln maintained uh, because he was the he was the president of people, not a government per se. And so he, he gave a lot of access to people. And this was the beginning of a change in, in, in certainly the Civil War, you know, with the rise of the Pinkertons and, and an interest in protecting the president from potential assassinations. But he was still, as we know, because this is how he fell, very vulnerable. And it wasn't that hard when we look at it. It wasn't that hard to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. No, I mean, when you, when, when it, what it comes down to is that if you went up and knocked on the door of the White House, you probably had a 40% chance of the president or the first lady answering the door. I mean, it was, a, it, was a little, it was a little different during the Civil War because there were always people that were deluging the president with right. requests, requests. And, 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 and right. requests for government contracts and things of that nature. But, I mean, our presidents were very, very accessible. And if you – and, you know, again, it's kind of a, a, a byproduct of being, you know, an assassination – Historian, for lack of a better word, but I won't. But you, if you watch the news coverage of the British Prime Minister, for example, he travels with one bodyguard, uh, maybe an advance man and a driver, and that's and that's pretty much it. Whereas in the United States now, you know, I mean, the president really can't move from the residence to the West Wing without you know thirty people following him, plus right. you know, God knows how much. Uh, you know, surveillance there is, and one of the most interesting um, facts is that one of the one of the last things that Abraham Lincoln signed before he left the Ford's Theater on April 14, 1865, was the bill creating the United States Secret Service. Right. Yeah. You know, um, it, it, to speak, I mean, in a way, that's prescient, right? I mean, we can mm -hmm. say that. Uh, that... Oh, yeah, but the government's always behind the curve, so. Right. Yeah. Signs the bill in 1865. They don't take over presidential protection until 1902. So right, right, right. But I mean, that's really interesting, though, too. That it was still. That's what I mean by prescient. I mean, it sort of predicted a future, but it didn't. It wasn't living in the current reality and the accessibility of somebody like a John Wilkes Booth. It, let, let's. I mean, if I, I would, I will use the the word. Um, buff assassination buff maybe i i like i've been reading books about this and had many coast to coast interviews about um these subjects over the years as you might imagine what interests me always coming it comes back to is those pivotal moments of history both the ones that we understood in real time and the ones that took us a generation or two to unpack and to really kind of figure out how things happened. That's that's my interest. I never side with the shooter. No. I always I always stay very victim centric. In the case of Abraham Lincoln and John Wilkes Booth, I think that was interesting that he had John Wilkes Booth had such a titanic ego that he thought it would be all about him and that he would be celebrated and he was already such a celebrity uh, that clearly people would be throwing rose petals at his feet, which is insane, but not unlike maybe the celebrity culture in which we live today. Oh, that's true. And he actually makes notations in his diary, uh, which is available, you know, at Ford's, at the Ford's Theater Museum. But he talks about uh, he's being hunted down like an animal for doing what Brutus was 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 heralded for, and William Tell, etc. So there was always that huge monumental ego that he was at. What he was doing was patriotic for for his country, which right. 
you know, he mistakenly considered to be um, the South. But he always wrote that he considered <clears throat> Lincoln to be a tyrant, that he wanted to, uh, you know, strike one blow, do something grand. And it seemed more about adulation and recognition, uh, all, at least almost as much as it was about, you know, trying to you know, reposition the South and doing something great for a cause that he believed in. It's just the cause was crazy. Yeah, this 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 brings us back to comic books, right? That you have to have a villain that is as super as the superhero, and it, that without that, there the, the, we lose the duality. So his imagination and John Wilkes Booth imagination, he was equal to the president of the United States, and that's why he he saw himself as being in this role. That they were on a different plane. Uh, and that's why the the need to ass- assassinate him fell to him, because other people would have been lesser men and would not have been able to achieve that. But he could, and he did. Lesser men would not have attempted it. And there's actually some evidence in the record that, you know, even prior to the assassination, maybe a couple of years before, um, that Lincoln actually wanted to meet John Wilkes Booth, you know, having been to a number of theater performances in Washington, D.C. And, and on, at least on one occasion, Booth refused the president coming back to meet him after a after a play hmm. and i mean think about that for a second uh, I yeah mean, you know a sitting president wants to say hello shake your hand and you know maybe with one or two exceptions um i mean I, certainly any sitting president who who who, who requested my president's presence if such a weird thing ever happened you know i would have been i would have been there in a second so um yeah and then you but at the same time then you think about the number of sports teams that fracture around the annual Rose Garden photo op. Yeah, it's true, and you know, it's and and, and I think, and that kind of leads to we're getting into some complicated ground here because sometimes it's not a question of political ideology; it's just a question of you know someone who someone who's in a position that wields tremendous power, and when you think about the the very nature of the presidency and, and the and the you know the issues that that, we, that a president has to deal with on a daily basis. I don't think the average person can 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 appreciate how much goes into the job. And I I, right. I jokingly refer to something called the "oh crap" moment, and, yeah. and it happens with most presidents. And and, and I'm going to yeah. use Barack Obama as an example, not because of any political ideology reasons, it's just one of the more more recent ones. Um, but when Barack Obama ran for president uh, in 2008 against John McCain, basically part of his campaign platform uh, was that he was dead set against pretty much 90 percent of the of, of, of the elements of the Bush Cheney anti-terror right. regimen, and had been vocal about it. Right, very vocal about it. But there, you know, but but again, that's 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 true for any presidential right. candidate because they quickly find out there's a difference between campaigning and governing. Right. So, and and then somebody hands him the jailer's keys, and then you have that moment. Well, it's kind of like you know, you you, you do it. You, you take the oath of office. You deliver your inaugural address. You you, you know, you you leave the reviewing stand in front of the Capitol, and you know, there's 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 two young men in gray suits with a briefcase chained to their wrist with I with, with what right. I call the oh crap book. Mr. Right. President, can we have a few minutes of your time? And then you go through. He goes through the book and says, "Oh crap! I didn't know it was this bad." Right. And as a result, what did Barack Obama change about the Bush Cheney anti-terrorism, you know, paradigm? One thing: we don't waterboard anymore. Yeah, not much. So, you know, and, again, including Guantanamo, which had been priority number one. I'm going to shut down Guantanamo, and then you kind of actually look at it, and he was like, "Well, we don't have to well, do that first. Well, there are some good reasons, but again. <laughs> But again, and, and that's the, the, the point that I make, too. You know, we all express our opinions right. um, you know, about, gov- about what government should do, and et cetera. But we all make that in an imperfect world with, with, with right. a paucity of information that at a certain point, I have to leave it up to the president to say, you know, this guy knows what he's doing, or this guy you know, knows the correct path, or this guy is being advised by some very knowledgeable individuals in terms of economics, foreign policy, et cetera. Um, that allow him to make those decisions, and sometimes we as citizens aren't privy to that information. No. And, and to some extent, especially when national security is involved, n- nor should we be. Right. I mean, that's the paradigm of intelligence, right? Right. Um, if, if 
you know, we get information, can we act on it without revealing the source of that intelligence just by the very nature of who had the information and how we got it? So. Well, that's kind of the key moment between, you know, our grand American experiment as a democratic republic. That's when we're not, a, that's when we don't actually practice a kind of democracy. And that's when we're a republic. This is a, these are the elected officials. They make that decision. We don't put that up for a referendum. And the more you put that out there for the public, the more that becomes, you know, part of the political landscape when it shouldn't be because there's so much more to explain all the, that's going into it may take forever. And I'm a big believer in transparency. And I think there are way too many things that this government has not been transparent about that it could be. But I, I also always hold out on what I don't know um, and and try never to let my ego get into it that I feel like I should get to know everything I that really isn't my agency but this brings us back to John Wilkes Booth too and the fact that as we focus on him and again we're talking with our guest uh, Paul DeBoli about his ongoing theory and the work he's doing on John Wilkes Booth is that he he this may have been and what we know now much more about assassins and about people who are um, sociopathic is that he may have had a mental illness. And like a lot of other people out there who have committed these crimes, he may not have been in his right mind. Not to say that he would have gotten off with a, you know, uh, insanity plea, but that it's, it's entirely possible as we look back in history, we don't have enough data to judge the soundness of his mind. I don't think we have enough data to judge the soundness of anybody's minds, quite frankly. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, no, I mean, it's a science. That's a fair there point. So many, but there are so many variables involved. And, you know, body chemistry is, an incre you know, is, a, is, a, is a very complicated thing. We've all seen that commercial, and I don't recall what drug it's for, about people with, also, with Parkinson's that begin to hallucinate. And right. See things that aren't there. He's seeing so, two I mean, dogs, and he's seeing... Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, right. and um, you know, and I think that's cause for concern. But, I mean, let's face it, we have a, we have a, pres a would-be presidential assassin free walking the streets right now, John Hinckley. Um, True. Who shot President Reagan, who, as True. I understand it, is, out of, is, is, is no longer confined to an institution. So, you know, and a jury, you know, and it can, um, basically found him not criminally culpable, you know, for the assassination attempt because of, of you know, what we now call the Twinkie defense. But, I mean, is that valid? I don't know. But I think we can only begin to understand. That's you know, a really good point. Mind, the way that it functions, the chemical processes that are involved, and how those can be affected by imbalances. So. This is why, this is when I love talking to lawyers. Talking to you is really, I mean, because there's a distinct way of looking at things which is a little dispassionate. And I appreciate that because... You, you know, there's things we know and things we don't know. And there are things that when is a fact actually adjudicated as a fact? How do we determine in if we're not in a courtroom where there's an adversarial system and the series or whatever, we are kind of left up to, to a certain amount of of speculation, which if, if if it's done in good faith, it's not creepy. And I think that's part of what attracts me to this argument the most is that you're not fetishizing John Wilkes Booth or his actions. But we're looking at the possibility that maybe the very same titanic ego and out of control personality, which led him to believe that it was somehow his divine charge or his cosmic responsibility to kill Lincoln, also created its own orbit that sucked in other people into his belief system and perhaps provided an out. And that is where then we'll hit pause for the moment and come back uh, and talk with Paul DeBoli of uh, LaSalle University. We're talking about uh, John Wilkes Booth. Could he have survived the barn fire? Could he have been scurried away uh, and lived a long life? It's, it's a question that other people propose. I'm dying to hear what Paul has to say about it coming up next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Bunnett. You know, I I mentioned before that my my personal history in the United States, my family's history is kind of evenly split between Union and Rebel. And my southern mother was always very clear that, you know, she's sort of oddly proud of 
of having grown up in the South, um, but as she says without hesitation, that, that we fought on the right side for the wrong reason, that slavery was never worth defending. Honor, loyalty, those are bigger than any one side, but not when it was preventing people from, you know, uh, being able to have the equal rights that any American should enjoy. So, you know, I, 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 I was surrounded by Civil War memorabilia. There were Confederate and Union uh, jackets that my mother had displayed in our home. It was like a little Civil War museum, ball chain, um, bullets, muskets, swords, sabers. They were everywhere. And I... I appreciate that. And I, I try to enjoy the Civil War history of the United States as much as something like that can be enjoyed, knowing that it still led to a ridiculous loss of life and pain that is affecting us generations later. Um, I live in bleeding Kansas, and the subject of uh, Beecher's Bibles comes up all the time. Um, Henry Ward Beecher, the uh, famous renegade pastor, uh, who would send guns to outposts of abolitionists in places like Kansas in crates that were marked Bibles to get past any blockades. Uh, and he did it out of his own pocket uh, in order to keep the abolitionists from being picked off by pro-slavery forces that were rampaging through Kansas, based in, in Lawrence, um, one of the many reasons why nobody should like the University of Kansas, he said from K-State. Sorry, couldn't miss that. But it was bleeding Kansas because of slavery. And the South and all that I love about it and the people that are in it and my relatives and the kin I value so much, I, 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 it still comes back down to slavery was not worth defending. And John Wilkes Booth was wrong. And Abraham Lincoln should be our hero for saving the Union. Now, who saved John Wilkes Booth? That's a question we'll get back to next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. So in a plot that was fairly pervasive to take down not just uh, Abraham Lincoln, but the entire uh, Lincoln administration to cut off the head of the snake as they discussed it, um, John Wilkes Booth assassinates Abraham Lincoln. Uh, at Ford's Theater, uh, breaks an ankle, roughly jumping onto the stage, says Sic Semper uh, Tyrannis, which was supposedly said uh, on the assassination of Julius Caesar, although there's no proof of that. And that was, however, used uh, by Shakespeare in the play about Julius Caesar, it becomes popularized in Europe and is said right there. Um, and as dramatic as he could be, makes his exit, jumps on a horse and takes off um, and uh, and Union troops, police, citizenry, whoever was available, uh, gives chase. Um, let's let uh, our guest, Peter DeBoli, pick it up. Oh, sorry, Paul DeBoli, pick it up from here. Uh, Paul, you um, are a professor of the American presidency, as well as being an amateur historian. So start with that place. I think everybody knows that. Grabs the horse, takes off. He's in pain, and uh, he has, but John Wilkes Booth has a plan. Talk. Let's talk about the plan. Well, the initial plan was to kidnap Abraham Lincoln. Um, and the, the plan was to kidnap him, smuggle him across the Potomac, um, and then ransom him back to the Union for release of Confederate prisoners and an unspecified sum of cash. And there's some indication that there were a lot of war profiteers who were actually backing that plan. And it may have proceeded with the blessing of, 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 of what we refer to as the Confederate Secret Service or whatever their intelligence, you know, operation was. And, I mean, let's face it, every, every military, uh, every army does have an intelligence wing, and that, and that, and that goes back to, to, to Greek and Roman days. You always want to know what the other side is doing, correct? So um, we have this, this, this plan that was hatched, and, and it's kind of funny because I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm just outside of Boston, and a lot of the planning for um, the, uh, the uh, kidnapping actually occurred at the Omni Parker House in downtown Boston, which is, a, which is one of those 
wonderful old grand hotels that just factor into hmm. New England political history so much. Right. Of that. You know, well, little little known fact that Ho Chi Minh, when he was a student in Boston, actually was a was a was a waiter and busboy at the Parker huh. House. How about uh, that? Yeah, I mean, all roads do really lead to Boston at some point. So there's this there's this over there's this underlying plan to to kidnap Lincoln. And if you look at at, at Booth's diary, at, at one point, you know, while he's hiding in that pine thicket and he's jotting down some thoughts, he just laments that it, that that for six months we we worked to capture, um, and then you know their plans were frustrated. And what happened was. Um, you know, Washington, D.C. is a horrible place in the summer. I mean, it's heat, it's humidity, uh, et cetera. And I, can, and I can only imagine in 1865, um, you know, what, what the city was like. Oh, it's so, fetid, wasn't it? I mean, the people talk about the, the atmosphere hung. It does even still sometimes. And there was mosquito infestation, and it just sounded miserable. Yeah, and there was this horrible canal that ran through the center of the city. Right. Um, you know, connecting two branches of the Potomac. I mean, just a terrible, terrible place. So uh, about three miles from uh, the White House is the old soldier's home. Um, and, there was, and there was this wonderful, grand, gothic 34-room mansion on the grounds that Lincoln moved his family to during the, during the, the warmer weather, just to kind of get them out of Washington, D.C., uh, and historians are a little split uh, whether they were actually residing there, you know, at the time or not, or, and how often, et cetera. Um, but the plan was for uh, uh, several of, Booth cons- of Booth's conspirators to be dressed in Union uniforms, wait at a crossroads, and wait for Lincoln to drive by in his carriage on his way back to the White House. Uh, and, and, it, and we know of at least two occasions where they were lying in wait, uh, and Lincoln didn't show up. So complete and utter frustration. Um, you know, that coupled with, um, so there was this underlying plan. The question then becomes who's involved in the plan. And, you know, if you, you, can, you can look at the John Wilkes Booth diary and the missing pages. I know it kind of sounds like a, um, an episode of uh, uh, the Nicolas Cage movie, National Treasure. But, I mean, right. they're, 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 but all great. You know, fictional stories do start off with some type of historical fact. John Wilkes Booth did keep a diary. The diary um, was found on the body that purports to be John Wilkes Booth. Um, uh, the Union forces that captured him took the diary along with the body back to Washington, D.C., gave it to Lafayette Baker, who was head of the... Yeah, yeah, wait, wait. I don't want you to get a hold of the story yet. I, I want you to stick with me on, because I, I, this is really key, and I want to get to that part. But I feel like we need a little more context for people who don't know the story about the plan. So he takes off, right? And he's on a horse. And he's, the, as you said, the plan's been disrupted. Whatever that grand plan was to begin with, that no longer exists. So now it's going to be a series of like plan B's and ad libs, right? As he's heading off into, into the night. Well, I don't think there were total ad libs too, because Booth spent at least six months prior to the assassination, uh, riding around, uh, the Washington DC area purportedly looking for real estate investments. And if you look at some of Booth's correspondence, he was always looking to invest in an oil company or a water power company, uh, or, or, or buy real estate. So, that was kind of his his cover, cover. story. So right. He was investigating escape routes, et cetera. But I think the escape routes were more geared towards, you know, having two or three, four or five hostages that they could then ransom back to the union, to back to the union. And then, of course, um, you know, uh, Richmond falls, Lee surrenders, um, and Booth is just gone out of his mind at this point. Um, you know, the passage of the Thirteenth Amendment, uh, et cetera, was just more than this guy could handle. And he and he saw, and at some point, the you know, right after uh, you know Richmond falling and Lee surrender, the plan changes to from a kidnapping to an assassination. And there was actually a a, um, a long time employee of the of the Omni Parker House Hotel in Boston who wrote a memoir sixty years ago. And right next to the Parker House, there was a small shooting gallery, and he describes John Wilkes Booth going there hmm. uh, a couple of times to actually practice his shooting skills. Um, 
which is, you know, just, I mean, you want to talk about, about prescient and, you know, if, 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 you know, if I knew then what I knew now type. Uh, type right. Um, but but, I mean, but it, so, it, who, what's the first, what would have been his first obstacle in, in in even as well planned as he had originally thought this whole thing was going to run like clockwork, what was his first obstacle on his own after having shot Lincoln? Uh, well, first obstacle is getting out of the out of the building, um, and it, you know it's kind of funny too because um, Major um, so uh, Lincoln and Mrs. Lincoln are in the presidential box, um, and they're and they're with another couple. And the couple is Major Henry Rathbone and his fiancée, Clara Harris. Uh, but those weren't supposed to be the original guests. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, Ulysses S. Grant and his wife, Julia. Um, they were supposed to be get the guests of Lincoln that night. And for some reason, earlier in the day, they canceled. Now, if you go back through the historical record, Julia Grant expressed some concerns to her husband and to others that she was being stalked by John Wilkes Booth, hmm. and about I a, never heard that. About five days before, she was having lunch at a restaurant in downtown Washington D.C., and she notices John Wilkes Booth just staring at her. Now, Booth is arguably one of the most famous actors of his day, so that right. would kind of be the equivalent of you're sitting in a restaurant and 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 Brad Pitt is staring at you, or George Clooney. Right. I mean, that's how that's how noticeable it would have been. So, Mrs. Grant and and and, and Ulysses S. Grant, you know, c- you know, cancel on the Lincolns earlier in the day, um, and then Major H- Major Rathbone's invited, and he shoots Lincoln. Rathbone turns, tries to, and, and grapples with him. Uh, Booth draw, you know, pulls his um, his uh, his knife and slashes at Rathbone's arm. Before he jumps to the stage, stage right. just as an aside, Rathbone uh, always blamed himself for not sure. preventing the assassination of President right. Lincoln, uh, and eventually uh, remained with the U.S. Army, was stationed in, in Germany, I think at the U.S. Embassy, where he goes totally crazy several years later, kills his wife and oh, his no. children, and spends the rest of his life in an insane asylum in Germany. I didn't know that. It, that is it, fascinating. It, it, it's true. I mean... The, the 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 backstories of people that had right. some peripheral connection to the Lincoln assassination it, it's just fascinating how this how this one act affected literally hundreds of people and changed their lives it's it's truly amazing but when you, you know but if you like to play like all history games i mean i enjoy doing that okay you, you know you find a historical event of major importance and you just alter it slightly just to see how you know, things would have played out differently. What if Grant had um, right. company? Would he have been traveling with a protective detail? Would right. he have an adjutant? Would there have been several more people? But then think about the plan that Booth had, how crazy it was. He goes into a, a presidential box to shoot the president with four occupants of the box with a one-shot Derringer. And gets away with it in that and sense. I mean, actually... It. I mean, pulls it off in in the in a in that horrible twist, um, and yet when I've had other when I've read other books on this subject and and f- fascinating as they all are, they there is an element to this where I start to pick up if I were to imagine myself as John Wilkes Booth, mm-hmm. where my confidence as I'm riding away from that theater begins to erode somewhat that it, it may be not right away, but now there is not the, the, for all of the best laid plans here, he's now kind of on his own and, and he's got to get out of the city and then he's got to get to a place where he, because he's got to be in pain. So he has to be treated. So there's a series of must do things that he can't avoid which, and this is where in the mainstream telling of history, all lead him to that kind of desperate place where he would be found, you know, uh, uh, killed in the barn, surrounded by Union troops. But because we know that that is your, that that's your pursuit, that that may not have happened, I'm trying to get a better idea. What are the binary events that, you know, go left, go right, go 
back go forward, what are the events that happen that actually change the way you think we should look at history? Well, if you float shot it, for example, okay, once, right. once, once, he, once he shoots Lincoln, okay, his, obvi- his obvious, you know, next part of his plan is to escape. And, you know, and we, and, you know, we kind of know that because when he rode up to Ford's Theater, he, 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 there was a, there's like an alley behind, beside, beside and behind the theater. Right. He rides up on his horse and he asks the, the janitor of um, the theater, a gentleman named Ed Spangler, to hold his horse. And again, there's some there, there, there's a, a duality of the of, of the historical record. Some say that Spangler held his horse, which basically led to him being tried as a conspirator, uh, convicted and sentenced to life in prison for holding his horse. But there's also some some information that indicates that Spangler may have been more involved in the assassination plot on the periphery, or that somebody else held his horse. Be that as it may, he was planning on, 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 on doing the deed and making a quick escape. He goes into the theater. He wanders around. He looks for things. There's some indication that he was there earlier in the day and that he drilled a small hole in the door to the theater so he could look in to make sure that Lincoln didn't have a bodyguard. Uh, he goes in. He shoots Lincoln, um, grapples with Hathbone, Rathbone, stabs Rathbone. He's got to make his escape. He kind of figures out that someone's going to be rushing up the stairs towards there, so he, he more or less has to jump from the uh, from the presidential box to the stage. So jump about twelve feet. Uh, I I I know I wouldn't have made it without breaking something. I'm sure Bruce right. so kind of carried on with the, with the righteousness of his plan uh, that he couldn't even give that a consideration. Jumps to the stage, lands improperly, um, and, uh, and and fractures his ankle. Although some of the witnesses claim that he didn't fracture his left ankle when he jumped from the stage, hmm. that he actually that he actually fell on his right hand and his right knee. But again, eyewitness statements. I mean, they're all um, you know, there's. there's there's, there's always a degree of perception that's involved. Yeah, that, that sounds like the uh, the classic superhero landing, the right hand and the right knee that he lands like. Pretty much, yeah. You can yeah. picture you can picture yeah you know, Superman doing that. So, uh, well, okay, but but so again, he's heading out. Now he's gotten away. So we, however, it was that whoever was involved, how does he ever? I mean, how uh, is the historical record wrong where he could ever have found a way to not be held responsible for that act? Uh, I think I think his grand plan was to escape back to the, into southern ter- into southern territory, allow the South con- to continue their fight, be treated as a national hero there, uh, and then perhaps move on to something grander and greater than just a life on the stage. I think that was his long-term plan. Short-term plan, just shot the president, got to get out of Washington, D.C. Right. Okay? Got to get out of he's Washington. Got, he's got this plan, um, and the bridges, you know, were, um, Washington, D.C. was still under curfew, even though the, the war essentially, essentially surrendered, but the war is not over. And then basically there were isolated skirmishes between Union troops and Confederate sure. troops right up until late June of 1865. So the South wasn't giving up that easily. Um, so... Um, well, the South had, but some Southerners weren't. Yeah, like well, him, a, right. A large number of Southerners had not had had, had not given up there. We're not going to adjust. Yep. So, so he has to get. The, he's got to get over the bridges. How many bridges does John Wilkes Booth have to get past? Uh, there's one major bridge, which is the Navy Yard Bridge, that he has to get past. Uh, there were got, there, there are some stories that there was only one bridge that was left unprotected. That's not entirely true. Um, the Navy Yard Bridge did have a sentry that Booth managed to talk his way past, and he's off, and he's heading to Surrattsville. Um, um, Mary Surratt uh, was one of the conspirators. Um, she, she owned a, a rooming house in Washington, D.C., where, where a lot of the meetings between the conspirators uh, occurred. And there's some indication that her son, John, right. um, was actually one of the leading members of the conspiracy as well. And we'll talk more about John Surratt later, because... His escape um, and, av- and avoidance of prosecution, at least, at, at least initially, reads like a really great John Grisham novel, almost. Well, that's uh, where we'll uh, well, that's where we'll pause it then. Coming up to the top of the hour, Paul DeBoli um, from uh, LaSalle University in Newton, Massachusetts, were speculating using his research on whether John Wilkes Booth survived. 
How was it that he wasn't killed in that barn um, after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln on Coast to Coast AM? This is Ian Ponnet. We'll get back to the Mary Surratt story in just a second. Let me just uh, go over this with our guest, uh, Paul DeBoli. So on the 14th of April, 1865, Booth assassinates Lincoln. Uh, it's the next day that Booth arrives at the mud farm um, where he receives care for the ankle, at least in some respects. Now, as you said, there's some evidence that he did. Some people would claim that he didn't break an ankle when he jumped. What do we think then happened at the mud farm if he hadn't broken, if, it, if there was no injury to be tended to? Well, we have to back. We have to back up just a little bit, um, uh, because on his way out of Washington D.C., his first stop is not the mud farm, which which is about twenty five miles away from D.C. His first stop is to the, at the Surratt Tavern okay. in, Port, in Port Tobacco, uh, because he had hidden supplies there: a couple of rifles, some ammunition, some field glasses, etc. So. Um, Booth and his accomplice, which is believed to be a gentleman named Dave, a young man named David Harold, uh, ride up to the Surratt Tavern. Um, Booth, uh, Booth's leg is broken. He, uh, he refuses to get off his horse. Uh, Harold goes in and retrieves the supplies they had hidden there, and then they ride on to John uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Samuel Mudd's home. Um, they arrive there sometime around three or four a.m. Um, uh, they help Booth into the house. Um, they, um, if, if, as a matter of fact, if you go to the um, Samuel Mudd house, the, the couch on which Booth lay while Dr. Mudd treated him is still there. It's still owned and maintained by the, by the, by the Mudd family. Mm. Uh, Dr. Mudd cuts off his boot, fashions a splint and a crutch for him. Uh, then Booth then goes upstairs um, to, to get some rest and sleep. Uh, he's, you know, he's got a little comfort, maybe a little laudanum to take the edge off the pain, certainly probably some whiskey or brandy. Uh, he goes to sleep, uh, wakes up the next day, doesn't come down for breakfast, asks for a basin and a razor, and then shaves off his trademark mustache. Um, but let's just go back to the to, to, to Surat, um, uh, just for a moment. Sure. Uh, and it is Mother's Day. So Mary Surratt um, is is one of the principal planners of the conspiracy of the conspiracy um, and her husband and her son John who, who was caught as a Confederate spy signed an oath of allegiance to the Union uh, was released from jail and then, then went right back to spying for the South um, <clears throat> at the time of the assassination and there's some difference in opinion is that there's a, a show coming out on the History Channel that actually um, talks about John Surratt being the shooter and not John Wilkes Booth. Hmm. Uh, but, I don't, but I don't think the historical record supports that adequately. Um, hmm. So uh, they, Never heard they, that. They, they were, well, like I say, watch for it. I know they just shot the special uh, Interesting. a few weeks ago, so uh, it, it, it's probably going to be coming to light in the next several months. It's gonna, it'll, it'll be fascinating and entertaining. Um, um, when the when the when the when after the assassination, when the, when the Metro Police and the War Department Police Department, you know, begin scouring D.C., they actually go to um, uh, Mary Surratt's boarding house and begin to, and begin to question Mary Surratt. Um, one of the boarders at the Surratt boarding house was a, was a young man named Louis Weichmann. Weichmann was an employee of the War Department, and he notices a lot of things that are going on in um, in the Surratt boarding house that just don't make sense. You know, people coming at odd hours, John Wilkes Booth showing up, uh, lots of hushed conversations behind closed doors. Um, Mrs. Booth um, asks Weichmann to drive to to take her by carriage back to the Surratt Tavern. Um, in Mrs. Tavern. Booth? I'm sorry? You said Mrs. Booth? I'm sorry, Mi uh, Mrs. Surratt. I asks, just want to make sure. Right, go ahead. Thank you. Asks, asks Weichmann to take him to, take her to... Uh, their farm to drop off some parcels and packages, and he says something's not right. Um, and they make a notation, like all good bureaucrats, they make a notation in their log that, that Weichmann raised these issues. And I'm, and I'm not so sure that Weichmann wasn't involved in the conspiracy all the way, tend to think not, but there's that little nagging doubt. Yeah. Um, so when they round up the conspirators, they round, they round up Mrs. Um, 
Mrs. Surratt, imprison her, try her. She's convicted and hung along with Lewis Powell, George Azarat, right. uh, and one other person. There was also a warrant for John Surratt's arrest, but John Surratt was in northern New England or in Canada doing some spying, Confederate fundraising, money manipulation, etc. He realizes his mom's been arrested uh, and charged in the conspiracy. He hops a slow boat to London uh, and is eventually arrested two years later. Guess where, guess where he's been hiding out for the last two years? No. As a papal bodyguard. Oh, interesting. I did not know that. There's a wonderful picture of him um, dressed in his uniform of the, pa- of the papal zouave, which is a, uh, an infantry unit that was uh, created to protect the papal states. And that's where he's hiding out until U.S. Marshals huh. eventually arrest him, bring him back to the United States. Uh, he's tried in, I think, 1867, 1868, uh, and is acquitted. Yeah. And then yeah, that part I knew. Uh, but one of the theories is that they only arrested Mary Surratt as a way to get John Surratt to um, surrender. And John Surratt's not surrendering, so Mary Surratt goes to the gallows because her son would not return to face the charges. Yeah, that's a theory. I remember the movie The Conspirator, which is very sympathetic to her. And it also speaks to some interesting legal machinations, such as the fact that they tried her in a military court. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's and, you know one of the great... You know, one of the questions is, you know, in you know, because we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of 9/11, is you know, is is where do we try these people? Do we try them in civilian court? Do we try them before a military tribunal? And you know, again, you know, eight people were tried for their role in the conspiracy before a military tribunal. And when you think about it, it does make sense because Washington D.C. was under martial law at the time, correct? Yeah, but I think they isn't the you're the lawyer, but isn't the pervading sense from the defense's position is they could the there would have been almost a guarantee of a conviction in a military court, uh, but if she were afforded the same liberties that you would be in a criminal court in a non you know military criminal court, that she stood a really good chance of getting off. Oh, I As, and then we could see that's what happened with John Surratt. Yeah, I mean, I think she had a wonderful chance of, of getting off. But, I mean, at the time, too, you know, Edwin Stanton wielded tremendous power in right. uh, Washington, D.C. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a – one of the questions is, so we have this plot to decapitate the Union, whether it's through kidnapping or through assassination. And simultaneously, at the same time that, that Lincoln is assassinated by Booth, um, Andrew Johnson was supposed to be assassinated – uh, by one of the conspirators, George Azarot, and Secretary of State William Seward um, was supposed to be assassinated by came close by uh, Lewis Powell. Came close. He was assaulted. He was he was he was knifed. Um, yeah. Um, his son was was and his servant were beaten senseless. Um, but but you know they failed in that attempt. But but think about it for a second. You want to decapitate the Union government. I can understand you know, assassinating or kidnapping the president. I can understand the vice president because constitutionally he's next in line. But then they go to Secretary of State. Why wouldn't you assassinate or try to capture Stanton, who was arguably the second most important man in the country? Right. Right. So a lot of the, uh, so, uh, so the plan kind of points towards why would why would Stanton be 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 left out of this, you know, of this decapitation plot. And, you know, part of the theory is that the missing pages in the Booth Diary would tend to implicate Stanton. So they, so, and I know I'm jumping all over the place here, but there's just so much, and I feel like I have so Okay, well time. then let me get you back on track, because okay. I want to, because I just think this is important for us to eliminate things as we move forward. Uh-huh. So Booth arrives at the mud farm, he's treated the mud farm at the same time, um, we know that the uh, the General Grant then uh, charges the army to go find Booth and Harold, and they're spreading out everywhere. So the the net is being cast. Um, they find the boot at uh, Mud's house, so they know that Doctor Mud treated. Um, John Wilkes Booth there. So that means they're getting closer. Meanwhile, Booth is trying desperately to get across uh, the swamp area, and that leads to the Potomac, which would lead to freedom, right? Correct. Okay. And so he and Harold, this guy David Harold, they're still together. 
uh, and we know from the diary that you mentioned earlier, now Booth is getting dispatches. Now he's seeing the newspapers, and he's not the hero that he thought he was going to be. No, he's furious, and he was expecting to be back in Southern territory and welcomed with open arms. But I think a lot of Southerners realize that, you know, the, 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 the fight was over. They lost. And there was going to be Reconstruction, and Lincoln had already given a speech on Reconstruction, where he where he favored, you know, not you punishing know, the South, yeah, not severely, not uh, right. et cetera. And I think most Southerners realized that the best friend they had in the Union government at that point was going to be Abraham Lincoln, uh, you know, to 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 you know to to, to buttress against right. the radical Republicans. And, and the problem with Andrew Johnson is, at least being a Southerner, being from Tennessee. The eyes would be on him to not show favoritism to the South. Abraham Lincoln, you know, Nixon could go to China, but for Andrew Johnson, then it was a different, he was getting measured completely different than Lincoln would have been. Absolutely. And, but, one of the, but one of the truly startling things was on the afternoon of the assassination, Booth goes to Andrew Johnson's hotel and leaves a note for him. Are you home? Do not wish to disturb Jay Wilkes Booth. And leaves that at the front desk. Hmm. Think about the plan. The plan was to have George Azeroth assassinate Andrew Johnson later that evening. Why did Booth go to see him first? Right. That's amazing. And, so, and, it begs the, and, and, and basically he, he, he assigns the task of assassinating the vice president to... A drunkard, the least competent of the, the least of the conspirators, person right. who goes to the hotel, gets drunk in the bar, and says, "Oh, the heck with this," and goes home, and, and sleeps it off untouched. Right. So we you know, have Johnson, and, a southerner, who basically is the target of it. And were there other people that were better suited to assassinate Johnson involved in the conspiracy? Absolutely. But yet he chooses George Ad Adzerod, an unemployed carriage maker from Germany. And, and and you think about too the fact that he was in a hotel, security was lighter. There's many more people coming in. It's not a private residence. I mean, there's all these different ways that that could have been done. Well, but this at the same time, Booth and uh, this guy David Harold, it's right around this time that they meet up with Confederate soldiers. And to me, this is the part of the story that I always wondered about. But I I always looked at it as being one of those pivotal moments of history that pivoted away from John Wilkes Booth, but what if not? So he, he meets, they're at the Port Royal, right? That's where they're, yes. they're, trying, they're trying to cross the Potomac again. Uh -huh. um, and, and they're intercepted by Union gunboats. They have to turn back. And at the time, you know, and we, and we know this from his diary entry, Booth is, is, is hungry, he's cold, he's wet. He he's keeps trying pain. to get back to friendly territory. He can't do it, and he's just he, and he's just complaining bitterly in his diary about the gods conspiring against him to keep him from being welcomed back into the southern territory. And that's uh, where, but that's what I when I brought that up before too about the idea that now he's he's deeply into Plan C or D. It doesn't matter how much scouting he had done in advance. I mean, they're they're like hiding under an overturned boat at one time in mud. I mean, yeah, this I mean, is not they, I mean, not the plan. Horse for warmth, and then just right. hide inside the carcass. I mean, we're not. To, you know, I mean, we might be down to Plan L or M at this point. Right. Exactly. All right. So, but now we're we're now we're just days away though from um, the twenty sixth of April, uh, where David Harold surrenders, but Booth insists that he won't because they get the Union Army gets a tip uh, that Booth and Harold have just crossed the Potomac. They're hot on their trail. They end up in a tobacco barn. What happens here that you say is what history should reconsider? Well, there's some indication that so they're hiding out in, in, in Garrett's farm. They're in the tobacco barn. And if you've ever seen a tobacco barn, you really I have. It's more of yeah. So you realize it's more of a shed, right? With yeah. All it, of these, with all of these slats, nobody's nobody's going to be held too securely in a in a tobacco barn. It, so, for people who haven't seen one, it's 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 like it's almost more like a picket fence in a way because you want the air to run to 
to work its way through the barn, uh, the, the tobacco barn for the drying of the tobacco. Yes, and so they have these these these. It's like a picket fence with every, where every other picket isn't nailed at the bottom, so it can right. freely swing out. So right. there's ample opportunity for 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 people in the barn to escape. Um, David Harold surrenders. They 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 place him under arrest. Um, then they set the barn on fire, um, which was kind of stupid, um, you know, because night would destroy the night vision, et cetera. I mean, he's going to come out eventually, put a bunch of troops around there, and wait him out. But for some reason, they burned the barn down. Uh, and a soldier, Boston Corbett, sees a figure, a figure with a rifle inside the barn, silhouetted against the flames, fires one shot uh, that, that, that uh, strikes him in the neck. Union forces run in, they grab the guy, they drag him out, and they begin to question him. And then David Harold says, why are you calling him Booth? His name is Boyd. And as a matter of fact, the testimony of, um, of Garrett's daughters describe, Mr. describe him as representing himself as Mr. Boyd, uh, and that he had a mustache. Now, we know on the night, on, on early on the morning of the 15th, he shaved his mustache off. At Dr. Samuel Mudd's. Uh, and then on the 26th, or just prior to the 26th, the Garrett daughters described Mr. Boyd as having a mustache. Um, and, I'll, and, and I'll talk about the identification of the body. You know. yeah, yeah, we will. But here's what I want to point this out. For people who are proponents of the Booth dies in the fire narrative, they say he's an actor. Fashioning a mustache out of some quickly clipped hair and something sticky like, you know, a spirit gum on a lip, that that's nothing for an actor. Uh, and the, of course, he's going to say, you know, my name's Smith. What do you, you know? What, what do you mean calling me Booth? That, I mean, that that's for somebody who's on the lam from the law. That's that's 101. Why do you believe it's more significant than that? Well, first of all, he he he, um, he shaves off his mustache as a way to. I mean, it's one of his most prominent features. This long, his long flowing dark hair and the mustache. He shaves the mustache off. Doesn't make sense for him to take some tree sap and some hair clippings and 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 fashion a mustache. A unless it's a different mustache. type of mustache. Unless instead of the big, the famous, you know, handlebar that he wore, it's just. It's distracting facial hair, but I'm I'm going with you. Don't get me wrong. I'm not taking an opposing position because I, I love where you're going with this. It's uh, Paul de Boli is a professor at uh, LaSalle University just outside of Boston. So we're talking about John Wilkes Booth and we're going to talk about the body and what are the historical anomalies that everybody could agree on. Coming up next on Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Punnett. So at this point in the timeline of John Wilkes Booth, as we're talking with Paul DeBoli, he, you know, John Wilkes Booth and his co-conspirator had been running on empty for a couple of days. Nothing had gone their way. Uh, you know, the Union was patrolling the Potomac, trying to stop somebody from crossing when they successfully sent him back without even knowing that he had been in a boat that was attempting to uh, get across the Potomac. And then he ends up at Garrett's farm in, in a tobacco barn. Uh, and, uh, and this is where, as we just heard Paul discuss, um, it, the very foundation of the mistaken identity claim begins. He identifies Harold and identifies his traveler fellow traveler as boyd and that man has a mustache say the daughters of the farmer and and then when the death occurs in the barn harold says to the troops that shot him why'd you kill him he's not booth he's boyd so that's where we'll pick it up coming up in just a second. And we'll look for what evidence supports, what empirical evidence could support such a claim that the wrong guy was killed uh, and that uh, the, the man that they needed, the fugitive, got away. We'll get to the end of the story next on Coast to Coast. This is Ian Punnett. Okay, so I'm excited about this. This is the, this is the, this is the scene that matters 
the most. This is where it all pivots. If you're following along on Coast to Coast AM, uh, Paul DeBoli is our guest. So John Wilkes Booth, if to accept the idea that there really was a guy named Boyd, my first question is, who was Boyd? Who did David Harold pick up along the road named Boyd? And why do we think that that we should take that seriously? Uh, well, well, starting at the end and working back, one of the things that's so interesting is the uncanny resemblance between John Wilkes Booth and James William Boyd. Uh, if you put pictures of them side by side, um, there's an astounding um, resemblance. Who and, is he? Uh, Boyd is a is a captain with the ten- with the Tennessee Artillery Company. There's some indication that Bo- that uh, Boyd might have been a Union spy. Um, uh, Boyd's captured. He's being held at Hilton Head, South Carolina, uh, and in and in February we see a letter from. Edwin Stanton to the to the commandant of this prison camp uh, that orders Captain James William Boyd to be to be tri- to be uh, removed from the camp and delivered to the provost marshal in Washington D.C. with the greatest possible haste. Um, and the commander does that. They they, they they grab Boyd. They bring him to Washington D.C. They bring him to the provost marshal, who works directly for the Secretary of War, and Boyd is never seen again. Think about it for a second. We have this captain in the in a Tennessee volunteer artillery company, and the Secretary of War personally, Edwin McMaster Stanton, sends a letter to the commandant of the prison camp asking that he be delivered to the Provost Marshal in Washington D.C., which is done, and Boyd's never heard from again. Why do you think they chose him? Uh, I um, for a variety of reasons. Number one, he might have been a Union spy. Uh, and he might have played some other role in the uh, assassination or, or perhaps even in the investigation of the assassination. Uh, you know, where, a, a spy where, for the Union or a spy against the Union? Spy for the Union. Okay. So he says, free this guy. He's in, he's in jail. He's really one of the good ones. Bring him back to Washington. And it just so happens that he's a dead ringer for John Wilkes Booth. Oh, I think the reason why he's brought back to Washington is because he's a dead ringer for John. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Or, so you he... play, or you could play devil's advocate, okay, that for some unknown reason, Boyd ends up at Garrett's farm. The Union troops show up. There's a reward out for John Wilkes Booth. And everyone gets a share of the reward. So if you're some Union private, you're going to get about $27,000 in U.S. money as your share of the reward. Wait, wait, wait. And that's $27,000 USD, circa 1965. Yes. Right? So that would have been a serious chunk of money if we look at it in Absolutely. terms of cost and of living how increase. How important for these troops would it be to have Booth or is good enough, good enough to get the reward? Okay. And so maybe you're saying that some of these Union soldiers are looking at at Boyd going, huh. Looks like if, Booth to me. Yeah, looks like Booth to me. Now, where do – going back to that, that meeting where they bump into the Confederate soldiers, could it be that's where Booth ends up getting – uh, taken away, or do we think that he's just hiding in the woods somewhere waiting for all of this to blow over? I think he's working through his escape plan, and, and he gets to one of, the, one of the theories is he gets to the Potomac, and he gets ushered across, and that Boyd is with him. Uh, just, some sold, just some Confederate sympathizers looking to get back into friendly territory. He can't pay the guy because he left his diary at Garrett's farm. Booth's there with a broken leg. Boyd says, I'll go back and get it. He goes back and gets it. That's when the Union troops show up. Mm. So, I mean, eminently plausible. Do we have any proof of that? No. Unless no. we find some long... Some Forgotten long receipt letter, or something. You know, somewhere. Yeah. But, um, so, Booth makes his escape. And there's some indication of that, too, because there was a, there was a, a, a historiographer from the University of the South uh, named Arthur Ben Chitty. And through his research, he discovers that a John Wilkes Booth marries Louisa Payne, a widow with one child, in February of 1872. 
Okay. Johnson Let's, County, Tennessee. You're jumping ahead again. I want to get. I want to go back to where the body is lying, right? It's because right there, that's still we're still in that pivotal moment of okay. So the troops come up, and he says, "That's not Booth. That's Boyd." What do they do to verify that that really was John Wilkes Booth that had been shot inside the smoky, burning tobacco barn of Garrett's farm? At that point, they don't do anything. They bundle up the body. They transfer the body back to Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, it's placed aboard a Union ironclad called the Montauk. Um, and they fashioned this this toppling and then had a carpenter's bench, and they were going to do the, the, the autopsy right on the deck. Is he uh, packed in ice? No, it's just, I mean, it's 1865. What do you guys right. Well, no, but I'm asking, like, could it be that, I just want to make sure that, so it's, that it's, it's hot, the bl- body is going to start to bloat, and that would... Well, and putrefy, sure. Yeah, and that would aid in being able to prevent the proper identification of a body. Absolutely. And then they get the body back on board the Montauk, and who do they have identify? The bo- I mean, when you talk, we all watch detective stories, right? We know how that works. There's a dead body. The body has to be identified. Who do they go to? Family members, friends, right. close right. associates, okay? Right. They did none of that. They have the captain of the Montauk, the acting captain of the Montauk, identify the body. How do you know John Wilkes Booth? Well, I saw him in a play a couple of times. Really? That's the basis for your identification? Right. Who knows what what disguise he was wearing in the play? Who knows? Although he was a very – I mean, let's be be clear. It's not – I mean, the Booth family were like the Baldwins, right, of their era. And the the brothers were all actors, and they were well-known, and they were publicized. And John Wilkes Booth being the most popular of the brothers, his he had one of the most recognizable faces in the country at that time. Nominally. Because you got to remember, photography was still in its infancy at this point. They didn't have TV. They didn't have... You know, weekend edition. They didn't have all of these goofy TV shows that would showcase these famous people. So basically, the only people that would know John Wilkes Booth are people that had been to the theater. And granted, that could have been a considerable number of people, but I don't think I don't think his image has been broadcast enough I, and to to draw that to draw that conclusion. Well, he, he yes, he was one of the most famous actors of his day, but how many people actually got to see? Well, here's the reason I said whether and this is to only bolster your case. Uh, counselor, I'm just saying I think there's some empirical evidence that says he had been featured in so many newspaper articles Uh that his face was, that he really was the kind of person who could walk up and down the street and people would be immediately tittering. Women, he was a large heartthrob for women at the time that people had his photo um, or had an etching of his image that they used like um, like we might use the cover of, you know, uh, a photo play or a popular website where they were following him as an actor and a, and a, uh, a well-known sort of the man that men wanted to be and women wanted to be with kind of a but guy. But there are people that do, you know, I mean, we all see people that bear startling resemblances to other people. And That's true. You have to ask. I, you know, I mean, when I had my grad school yearbook picture, picture taken, a guy told me I looked just like Jerry Falwell. So, I mean, right. you know, right. anybody That's can funny. look like anybody. So, <laughs> I got to um, go look at your bio again. So, um, so that would have been very comic when you were working for the Bush administration. That could have been funny. Um, so there's... They're, so they're, it's not exactly like they're getting somebody who had been his makeup artist at the Ford's Theater who knew, knew every contour of his face. They're just picking this guy who had seen him somewhere and said, yeah, that pretty much looks like him. But a lot of people kind of had that look, too, at the same time. Pretty were much. there any other measurements that were taken of the body? No. I mean, very, very few. I mean, and, and the post-mortem examination then is very, very different than the post than the post-mortem examinations now. Uh, but so were identification procedures. Like I said, so they had the master of the Montauk. They had, you know, another sailor who had seen him in a play. But also being held on, in the brig on the Montauk were the other conspirators. And hmm. they weren't called upon to identify him. One of Booth's brothers was being held in Washington, D.C., as a possible accomplice. Would he that have been believed if they had, though? If they brought him up and they said, is that him? Wouldn't they have said, absolutely, 
got him knowing that John Wilkes Booth was now on a horse heading somewhere to Mexico? Not sure. I mean, that, but that would imply that the brothers had caused close conflict. We, we do know that, his, that, that John Wilkes Booth and his brother Edwin were estranged because uh, both of Booth's brothers that he was closest to, Edwin and Junius, were, were, were abolitionists. And, yeah. and, 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 and Booth had was having serious you know, oh, yeah. problems with them at the time. I mean, I think he even sp- stopped speaking to Edwin for a period of time over, over, over their difference in opinion. He went and celebrated the hanging of John Brown. He did. John Wilkes Booth. Dressed yeah. as a soldier. Yeah, um, dressed as a soldier so he could get there and, and so, almost taunt him, I believe, is what the story was. Pretty much. But one of the things that's also interesting about the, about, about the uh, identification of the body is that uh, Edwin Stanton was the master manipulator and, and, and the master of the, of, of the message, so to speak. And he allowed one picture of the body to be taken by Alexander Gardner, the famous Civil War photographer. And that, and that, uh, and he actually had a War Department detective. Uh, so they're on the boat. Gardner takes a picture of the body. They, he then assigns a War Department detective, uh, Wardell was his name, to accompany uh, Gardner and his assistant Timothy O'Sullivan back to their studio, where he was to oversee the developing of the negative and the making of one print and only one print. And that negative, that glass negative, and that print were supposed to be taken from Gardner's studio by Wardell back to Stanton directly, which he did. Hmm. But on his way back to um, the, the War Department offices, he opened the envelope and peeked. And he looked at the picture. And the picture showed a bushy mustache. Oh, interesting. Which Booth, now I've never had a mustache. I couldn't grow a mustache to save my <laughs> life. I'm assuming it takes more than 12 days to grow a <laughs> yeah. unkept mustache, right. um, so, which, is a, which is another story. Now, they identify, they also have the room, the, uh, uh, the guest clerk at the National Hotel identify the body. Um, and the, one of the things that he did to identify the body uh, was um, uh, a tattoo. And Booth's sister, Asia Booth Clark, wrote a memoir of her brother, and she describes how when he was younger, he was, he was rambunctious, uh, and he um, was right-handed, and he, um, t- with India ink tattooed on his left wrist, his initials, JWB. And it was very, very common for young men uh, to, to, to do that at that period of time, as near as I can tell from my research. Hmm. So we have Booth, who's right-handed, who, who then, you know, using a needle and in India and basically pricks an outline of his, um, of his initials on his left wrist. But think about it. That makes sense, right? If you're right-handed, you're going to do it on your left wrist because if you're, if you're not left-handed, you really don't have the dexterity and the control to right. do something so delicate. Right. Now we have Boyd. Boyd has his initials on his wrist, too. And I know this sounds awfully convenient. The question then becomes, was Boyd left-handed or right-handed? And it's John William Boyd. James William Boyd. James William Boyd. Okay. And the desk clerk at the hotel talks talks about, uh, you know, identifying Booth based on the... um, uh, the, the tattooed initials on his left wrist makes perfect sense. However, the body that's on the Montauk has the initials on the right wrist. So then the question becomes: Is James William Boyd left-handed or right-handed? And I've looked and I've looked at a picture of Boyd, and I was able to, you know, very basically to to uh, uh, superimpose a grid over the picture. Now. When I was a young man, I used to work in my Uncle Louie's tailor shop. And one of the mm. things that Uncle Louie always told me mm. was that a person, when you shorten the sleeves of someone on a suit, you're going to have to shorten the sleeve about a half inch more on the person's dominant hand. So he could look at somebody and tell whether they were left-handed or right-handed just because the shoulder on the right, if they were right-handed, the shoulder on the right-hand side was a little, was just a little bit lower than on the left because the muscles were more well-developed. Hmm. And that's one of those things that you just kind of like pick up and file. Yeah, with. really. That's but cool. When I, but when I superimpose the grid um, over Boyd's picture, we see that Boyd's left arm, left shoulder, is much lower than his right, which would hmm. seem to 
indicate that Captain Boyd would have been left-handed, which is why the initials are on his right wrist. So we have a body that's not properly identified, that has the initials on the wrong wrist, and a mustache when the mustache was shaved off 12 days before. This is uh, this is very interesting, Paul. So thank you. And we're not done yet. We'll get to questions for you coming up in just a few minutes. Where are you going with this? You've done all this cool work. Is this a book? Is this a movie script? Where are you? What are you doing with all this? Uh, well, um, um, I, I have written a book. It's called Conspiracy. Well, the, the title right now is Conspiracy One Hundred and One. Uh, and it basically takes my conspiracy in American politics course and puts it into book form. Um, um, the book uh, it will be published by Beaufort Books probably sometime next year, early next year. Um, but we started the Salem Witch Trials. We move into the Lincoln kidnapping, the Lincoln right. assassination, the escape of Booth. I've also solved the mystery of JFK, by the way. So uh, well, That's always handy. Good. You course. did that, and then you moved on to other chapters, I hope, after it? Yeah, pretty much. Having right. dispatched that quickly? Just kind yeah, of... well, we, we do that. We do JFK. We do RFK, no conspiracy. We, t- we take a look at Watergate. You know, we kind of look at what the, what the consequences of Watergate are. Right. And Where I'm, are you with MLK? And, and, I, and I alluded to that earlier. So, Where are you with MLK on uh, assassination conspiracy? Um, you know, just... It was it was just a racist jerk who who who, who shot a political activist. I mean, I had his uh, I had one of the attorneys on several times, uh, William Pepper, I believe his name was, and uh, boy did he make a convincing case for oh, that that weird FBI involvement, of course. moving him out. I mean, and Hoover is amazing, but I, but if you like, in the next hour, I'll drop a nice big Hoover bomb on you. All right, we'll do a Hoover bomb coming up. Everybody, stand by Hoover bomb. Uh, an H bomb, maybe another way to look at that too. So we'll get to that. We'll give you the numbers you need coming up in just a minute. The last hour will be you engaged with Paul DeBoley on the John Wilkes Booth assassination uh, of Abraham Lincoln. Has he convinced you? We'll talk where he ended up. We haven't got to that part yet. Where did he live out his life? Next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. So we'll boil it down. Who was it that our guest Paul DeBoley believes did save John Wilkes Booth's life? And where did he end up? How did his natural life end? We'll get to that and all of your questions next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Now, Paul, I know we're going to get to these uh, questions here in just a second, but let me ask you before we do. So do we don't have a specific name. There's no actual conduit who's mentioned somebody who was a co-conspirator that that got John Wilkes Booth out of there. We just think the possibility was that this other guy went back for Booth's diary. That's why he had it with him in the barn. Uh, and that Booth, having heard about it later, was like, you know, Time to skedaddle. And so he was able, thinking that the the heat was off, pardon the bad pun, um, and he gets away. But there's no one person that history indicates was the hand that reached out in the confusion. No, there is not. I mean, there are a bunch of people that were peripherally involved, including Willie Jett, who was a Southern soldier, etc. But no one has, has come forward or been identified as the person. This person transported Booth across... Uh, the Potomac or across the river to the south, you know, after April 26th. Right. Okay. And then where do you, Matt, you mentioned the, and I thank you for letting me dial you back from it. So then he later on, like in 1875, he, there's a record of him getting married? 1872, yeah. Um, 1872. There's, a, there's a, um, a story, I saw it on a, a TV show, and then when I actually did the research, uh, and look back into uh, Professor Chitty's records. Um, um, That's a really unfortunate name. It is. It is. But I mean, he was a, he was a great historiographer. I bet he was. But uh, and he and he assembled, you know, you know, literally hundreds of feet of file shelf information uh, on John Wilkes Booth. I get and it. Observed that for 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 later. You know, research as an historian is to follow, and I'm and I'm indebted, I'm indebted to oh. and Shitty just for that work. But he, yeah. but oh, um, <clears throat> a man is in um, 
the area of Suwannee, Tennessee. He meets right. a woman named Louisa Payne. Um, she's a widow. She already has uh, one son. She, they get married. Um, and then he, and then after they get married, he confides in her that his name is not X, and that he, re- and that his real name is John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of Abraham Lincoln. And Louisa Payne is furious. She's not furious that he killed Lincoln. She's furious that she married him under the wrong name. So she then forces him to go back to the county courthouse, fill out the proper paperwork, and then marries her again as. John W. Booth. Hmm. Uh, Which isn't that uncommon of a name. I mean, you could theoretically, you know, seven years after an assassination, uh, you could use that name. Nobody would have thought differently, right? Uh, I think we all know the name John Wilkes Booth. Uh, Yeah, but John W. Booth. It's not outside the possibility. Um, But, you know, and and sometimes we have to rely on family lore, which is very, very, you know, powerful. And maybe, you know, and may in fact be untrue. I mean, there were a number of people who claimed to have been lineal descendants of John Wilkes Booth. Uh, and I know the History Channel just did a special where they tested um, DNA, their DNA versus the DNA of living Booth family, not John Wilkes Booth, but Booth family right. descendants, and found that they weren't related. So, okay. but there was, a, but there was, a, but um, as the story goes, there is there. Was, uh, Louisa Payne, when, when John Wilkes Booth left her, he said, look, I'm going to head out west. I'll send for you. He never sent for her. Uh, and when he left, she was married and pregnant. And mm. she gave birth to a daughter. Mm. Uh, and, and the daughter always carried the Booth name. As a matter of fact, she, she became an actress. Her name was Laura Booth, and she always identified herself as, mm. as Laura Booth. Um, but the story, but um, the uh Booth, we know that Booth leaves the, the Tennessee, the Johnson County, Tennessee area, and heads out west to Granby, Texas, Enid, Oklahoma. Um, and um, he was being sued, um, hmm. the, the, and adopts a new name. And the first name that, he, that, that we know that he used is a guy named John St. Helen, which kind of bears no relationship. It's kind of it's kind of a flowery name for. Yeah, it's got a stage kind of yeah, name to it. Stage presence. You know, right. again, sometimes we look for things that reinforce what we believe. But the second name he uses is David E. George. And if you think about it for a second, David E. Harold was one of the conspirators. George Adzerat was one of the conspirators. Right. David E. George. And again, this could be just an extraordinary coincidence. Um but based on my research, I don't. I I think that was maybe Booth just kind of thumbing his nose or something. So anyhow, okay. he, he, um, John St. Helens is getting is getting is getting sued. Uh, he hires an attorney named Finus Bates to represent him. Uh, and the reason why he wanted to be represented by an attorney was he did not want to go into federal court in the Granby, Texas area because there was still an arrest warrant out for John Wilkes Booth, and mm. he didn't want some pain in the neck deputy U.S. Marshal putting two and two together um, because of his appearance, etc. So he, he hires Finest Bates and the matter's disposed of. And Bates and John St. Helen become friends. Um, St. Helen gets deathly ill. And, you know, and the, again, this is, this is in, the, in the late 1870s. I mean, the, 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 you know, the flu, um, you know, killed a number of people every year, pneumonia, I mean, you name it. It was kind of a, it was kind of a bacterial, bacterial, virological, you know, right. square dance out there. Um, and people would die from what we consider to be mundane illnesses. Okay, John St. Helen gets sick, and he's feverish, and he's um, um, literally near death. And he sends for his attorney, Finus Bates. Bates goes to his hotel room, and in the midst of the fever, um, he tells Bates, there's a picture under my pillow. If I die, please send the picture to my brother with a note that says I've passed. And the brother's name he gives is Booth. Hmm. Uh, and at some point, I mean, I've seen two conflicting accounts. Uh, Bates's book talks about Edwin Booth. Other witnesses talk about Junius Booth, uh, both of whom were brothers. Uh, sure elder brothers of John Wilkes Booth. Right. Um, but then St. Helens survives. 
And a couple of weeks later, he's meeting with Finest Bates, and he said, you know, hey, you know, when I was when I was feverish and, and ill, I right. believe I was going to die, and um, you know, I made this disclosure that I'm I'm John Wilkes Booth, and I really am John Wilkes Booth. Um, and then they discuss it, um, and then okay. they kind of lose track of each other. He moves to Enid, Oklahoma. Um, he goes under the name David E. George in Eden, Oklahoma. And a lot of people in Enid are talking about this guy, David E. George, who would literally go out, go out and get drunk most nights, jump up on the bar, and start reciting lines from Shakespearean plays. Huh. He commits suicide in 1902. Um, among his papers, they find um, you know some correspondence with uh, Finest Bates. They send for Finest Bates, who at that time had moved back to, I believe, it, I believe it was from Tennessee. Also, he actually right. was Attorney General of Tennessee. And his daughter, his granddaughter, as a matter of fact, is Kathy Lee Bates, the actress. So, uh, whoa, the, 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 the that's Finest Bates, Bates' granddaughter. Finest Bates' granddaughter is Kathy. Okay. Is Kathy Bates, the actress. All right. We got a full boat of calls for you. Let's start with Robert, who's in Tucson, west of the Rockies. Um, he knows about that David George piece, right? That 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 end of the story didn't surprise you. No. Um, hello. Yeah. I, I um I was reading a, a book called Into the Shadows by Troy Taylor, which covered exactly what your guest has said. It pretty much matches everything. All the information you give is pretty much in that book. Also. Um, by the way, just as a side note, his brother Edwin Booth was a far better actor than John Wilkes Booth. In fact, many people allude to the fact that John Wilkes Booth was just a mediocre, second-rate actor, whereas his brother Edwin was a lead in plays. There was also a movie um, called Prince of Players about Edwin Booth, and it starred Richard Burton. Hmm. Uh, so that's all I wanted to uh, oh, that's interesting. Really cover. Thank you. I appreciate you adding that. First time caller line, Chuck, is in Ohio uh, for Paul DeBoli. Go ahead, Chuck. Oh, hi, gentlemen. I'm uh, really enjoying uh, the show. Um, I've got uh, two quick questions. The first one is, I don't think I heard it mentioned, whatever happened to the guard who failed to protect Lincoln, and um, was he ever prosecuted, or was he a friend of Booth? I mean, um uh, that's Kind no of indication that they then... were friends. Um, I forget the gentleman's name, but I know who you're talking about. Uh, and and there's two stories. Um, he number one, he deserted his post to go next door to the bar to have a drink, which is which is likely. Uh, and the second story is that he moved to someplace else in Ford's Theater to actually get a better view of the play because standing outside of you know, and guarding a closed door is probably right. very little fun. Uh, right. But he was but he was not charged criminally. He was not charged as a co-conspirator, nor was he disciplined by the War Department. But, but again, you have to remember um, that the president really had very, had, had very, uh, very little in terms of protection at that point, uh, and it wasn't until after the assassination of William McKinley that the um, uh, Secret Service actually took on the presidential protection, protection function, so that would have been sometime around 1902, 1903. Um, Lincoln did travel with a a, um, a, uh, a metropolitan police officer at some time. Sometimes it was a military aide or his valet that would accompany him. Uh, right. But there, there is no there is no record of any discipline or prosecution for people deserting their posts, which kind of makes you know. And again, assuming it was a War Department employee, it kind of makes sense um, that that might happen, especially if it if, if there's a stand involvement. If you right. if you you know, Booth's family was from Baltimore, and if you look at where the troops were dispatched uh, in the immediate aftermath, most of the troops, about 70% of the Union troops, were 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 dispatched to between Washington D.C. and Baltimore to the north, whereas only 30% were dispatched to the south. But if you think about it, that makes more of a makes more sense as an escape route for Booth. He'd want to get back into friendly territory quicker, right. rather than going back to his old home stopping grounds. And again, if you're John Wilkes Booth, the first thing they're going to do is that you know, looking at your family members, looking at your friends and associates, looking at the area that that's most familiar sure, with. Sure, so. sure, sure. You had another question, Chuck? Yeah, um, yeah. I was wondering too when they when they found Booth uh, at the barn, why didn't they? I mean, after they took him back for the autopsy, didn't they look at his? Uh, fractured ankle at all to help in the identification um it sounds like they didn't even consider that yeah i meant uh, to ask that they they did consider that um um and there's 
some split over which ankle ankle was fractured. The witnesses claim that he some of the witnesses claim that he landed on his on his left ankle, and that was the one that was broken. Uh, when he went to Dr. Samuel Mudd's house, the foot was so swollen they couldn't get his boot off, so Mudd had to cut the boot off and then just discarded the boot. Uh, when Union soldiers showed up at the house a couple of days later, um, they found the boot, and it was the left boot. Uh, but the identification of the body and the autopsy indicates a fracture on the right side. So, but again, you know, that's the interesting part about the putrefaction part, right? Because a lot of, of your indicator on an ankle would be how discolored it was, how the bruising, the swelling. If the body's swelling and discoloring all over, that becomes less of a a dead giveaway, if you're part of yeah, and uh, there was actually a physician named uh, Richard Arnold. He was a Navy physician for a lot of years who actually wrote a book on the misidentification of Booth's body, um, and he alludes to a lot of those similar points. Um, one other point that I want to make: when they identified the body, they brought in a doctor, John Frederick May, who was a surgeon in Washington D.C. at the time, and a couple of years before, he had identified the bo- he he had removed. Uh, um, um, a ganglion or some type of tumor from Booth's neck. Um, and they brought him, uh, Stanton and, and uh, Lafayette Baker brought him in to identify the body. And he gets there, and the first thing he says was, this body bears no relationship or resemblance to the John Wilkes Booth that I have known and treated. And then he goes into another room with Lafayette Baker. And then he comes out of the room with Lafayette Baker and says, yeah, that's, you know, show me the scar. Okay, the scar matches so that, that, that's the body of John Wilkes Booth. So we, we have this, you know, this non-identification, identification, re-identification that takes right. place that again causes people to have concerns over the way that they identify the body. Let's pick up the wild card line. Chuck is in Jackson, Michigan on Coast to Coast. Chuck? That's a fascinating show. And uh, as a relation to Lafayette Baker, I was wondering more about his role. Uh, you are a relation? You are related to him? Yeah, he'd be a first cousin four times removed. Oh, I would Is love that... to talk to you. Do you have any <laughs> papers? But, uh, but, but I'm wondering, too, wasn't he first in possession of the diary? He was first in possession. And, and here's the thing about diary, diary, who has the diary. Um, the head of the of the cavalry unit that, cap, that, that, that shoots and you know, captures, takes custody of John Wilkes Booth, removes the diary from the body, transports the diary back to... Washington D.C. gives the gives the diary to Lafayette Baker. Lafayette Baker kind of flicks through it, doesn't note any missing pages, gives it to Stanton. Stanton then looks at it and then gives it to the Judge Advocate General Holt. And the diary is not seen or mentioned until the impeachment trial of Andrew Johnson. Hmm. And then the then the then then the diary comes out of a War Department file, and lo and behold, there are a number of pages missing. Uh, Baker claims that I didn't notice any missing pages when I gave it to Stanton. Now, there was a book published in 1977 by a gentleman named Balzer. It was called The Lincoln Conspiracy. And in the book, he mentions a um, a document appraiser from Worthington, Massachusetts, named Joseph Lynch, who was called upon to examine um, personal papers of Edwin Stanton that were in the custody of the Stanton family, a descendant of the Stanton family. And he claims to have seen the pages from the Booth diary. And there Hmm. we lose track of them again. Uh, Chuck, can I do this? I want to put you on hold. If you want to, you can give some contact information uh, to Donna, who's handling the phones tonight. And therefore, if later on Paul DeBoli wants to get in touch with you, uh, he's got a lead. Yeah, that's great. Okay, can I do that? Put you on hold, Paul. Is, awesome. Are you good with Thank that? Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, wild card line. I think we have time for Wayne in Chicago on Coast to Coast AM. Go ahead, Wayne. Hey, thank you, Ian. Um, I want to ask your guests. Um, the show you probably were talking about earlier was Brad Nelson decoded, as far as uh, Booth Mary using his real name. Uh-huh. But here's, here's, here's my real question. Do you think Booth knew Jesse James and the Younger Brothers? Because all three were members of Knights of the Golden Circle. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. That is an interesting point, and I'm and I'm really not sure. Uh, you've probably given me an idea for a second book. So yeah, I think. and another History Channel special. <laughs> That'd be cool. Uh, 
But the Brad Meltzer show was good, and uh, the show that I was mentioning on the History Channel uh, it was Lawrence Fishburne hosts uh, History's Mysteries, and that's where they actually did the DNA testing um, uh, for from between Booth, Booth descendants and people who claim to be uh, issue of John Wilkes Booth. So be sure to watch for that. It was a great special. Thank you, Wayne. Appreciate that. All right, so we're uh, coming into the bottom of the hour. I don't want to, I don't want to give anybody just a, a a minute. But if if William, who's east of the Rockies in Pittsburgh, can be quick, we can get you in before the bottom of the hour. William, uh, long time listener, I'm gonna be super quick. Okay, number one, um, I would the the books that I've read said that Booth, um, when he gets to cross the bridge when he's exiting uh, Washington D.C., um, he knows the password. And this was the first time a password was used, um, and the password, I think, was TB, that he knew the password, the military, the secret password to get across that bridge. And two, um, I've read that Booth's diary was red, not black. And that's all I have okay. for you. Okay, that's great. I'll listen off there. Uh, Paul, we have a minute for your answer. Um, I've heard the thing about the um, um, about the password. Uh, and, and one of the things that I that I kind of look for is, you know, we 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 have these. All right, I tell you what, we don't have a minute for your answer. Hang on, we'll come right back. I, we're gonna. This is great, but stand by a second because uh, I I just looked up the clock and realized only had thirty seconds. So those are the two questions we're gonna get at: the cover and color of the diary and the passwords at the bridge. Um, and don't think that I forgot about your tease about the latest about the JFK assassination. We'll get to that too. Uh, and the phones now are still ringing. We'll get you an open line if we can next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. But it, it perfectly describes in some respects the spirit of what John Wilkes Booth had done. He had thumbed his nose at American democracy. He had decided to assassinate a president. He decided to elevate himself into the role of Brutus and that uh, that he was he was doing something just and that he was going to keep the South from falling at the hands of a of a tyrant who should never have challenged the South's sovereignty. Um, so glad that John Wilkes Booth um, was brought to justice, if only divine justice. Right. Never seemed like he lived a life of peace, didn't get the adulation that he wanted, didn't reign like a monarch in the South, didn't escape to Mexico, uh, was never celebrated. Uh, so he lived his life on the run after that uh, and died, according to some reports, if if our guest Paul DiPoli is, is, is accurate, at his own hand in 1902. Uh, and so it is that we're brought back to the phones and the lingering questions about how did he get over that bridge? Did he know the codes which would have gotten him past the military guards that would have encircled Washington, D.C.? And real quickly, Paul had talked about the diary, but I want to make sure I understand that next, too. On Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Punnett. So Paul DeBoli from uh, uh, LaSalle University outside of Boston, with the new book coming out, Conspiracy 101, I just might have a class where we might have to make that our textbook. Um, let me ask you about uh, about that very question then that got hung up there just before we got to the bottom of the hour. So it, it, does the cover of the color of the diary matter? Uh, not really. I mean, I mean, the diary is preserved, you know, and it's in the Ford State Museum. And I was just looking at a picture of it right now. Uh, and I've only seen pictures of it with the diary open, uh, and it appears as though the interior leather cover is red uh, and not black. One of the things that's interesting is, is that it's an 1864 diary, so if you kind of look at it, the dates are kind of, uh, you know, kind of off because 1864 was a leap year, 1865, everything. So if April 14th was a was a Thursday, then it would be a Friday right. in April in 1865. So right. um, there's some there, there's some problems in the way that it all lines up. Um, but the color of it's a you know I mean there, there, there's it's red. There's some black on it. I, I think I you know I think we know that that's immaterial. Just as kind of a, a another interesting aside, one of my favorite websites is the FBI Vault, uh, where the FBI does has this compendium of, of, of a 
lot of files that have been released under Freedom of Information Act requests. And if you kind of go, if you go to the vault and you look at the John Wilkes Booth file, which is kind of funny because Booth supposedly died in 1865, FBI was created in 1908, yet the yet, yet their file on John Wilkes Booth is 192 pages long. Hmm. Uh, but when the when the Lincoln conspiracy when the Balzer book came out, the Lincoln conspiracy, uh, there was a renewed interest uh, in John Wilkes Booth's diary, uh, and the National Park Service that has control and custody of the diary then for- sent the diary to the FBI crime laboratory and asked him to undergo some forensic testing, look at the, you know, how the missing pages were cut out, if there was any secret writing in there, and they kind of subjected it to infrared and X-rays and all kinds of other tests and found nothing hidden in the diary, but did, but did confirm that there were a number of pages that were missing um, and that it would be possible if the pages were found to attempt to match the pages up with the stubs of the paper that were left in the diary, but those pages, you know, haven't turned up, at least in the public, uh, in, in public domain. Uh, so the answer is I don't know what color the cover is. It appears as though it's red, uh, but it could be red and black. Uh, number two about the passwords. Yeah, um, I've heard that. I haven't seen that confirmed in any official documents. And in the and in the I'd book, always heard that too. Yeah, yeah. And in the in the book, I, I do mention um, the conspiracy theory. You know, the different theories. But I only really delve into things where there's actual information in the public record, and then do tons of footnotes so that you know you don't have to take my word for it. Just go off and you know do your own research. Right. At least this will guide you to it. Uh, but again, I have heard that it did not come out at time of trial. Um, a lot of the the, um, the the trial transcripts are available online. You can kind of look at the number of witnesses that they called and look at some of the questions that were asked of them. Uh, and nothing about the passwords came out uh, during the trial of the conspirators. Okay. Uh, all right. So Walt is in Pennsylvania. He's been waiting for a while on wild card line. Go ahead, Walt. Ian, I always look forward to you standing in for uh, the great George Nori. Uh, you're always a great, great guest, great conversation. Thank you. I was telling, I was telling Don, I'm sorry I dozed off last evening. I, from what I understand, there may have been a, a female version of Yahweh Jehovah, so that was, that would have been right up my alley. So I'm yeah. sorry I missed the show last night. Coast Insider, well, I, my man. Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, in the wake of these great uh, tragedies and events of history, there are always, uh, you know, theories that crop up, uh, you know, uh, whether it be Lincoln or the Kennedy assassination, if I'm not mistaken, Lee Harvey Oswald's been exhumed, uh, if not once, if not twice, at least once. And I was telling Donna that even into the early uh, 20th century, uh, there was even doubt that Lincoln was really in Lincoln's uh, tomb because in 1901, uh, the authorities got permission from Lincoln's son, Robert, to exhume the body. Right. And uh, sure enough, in 1901, they opened the coffin. And uh, from what I read of the accounts of, of, the, uh, of the exhumation, when they opened the coffin, there was a fetid odor. But Lincoln was still quite recognizable, and that's because when they took him uh, – from Washington back to Springfield, Illinois, on the whistle stop, it took the better part of two weeks. And every funeral director in that town, you know, he, they had him right. in Washington, then he took him up to New York right, City. Right, right, right. They would inject him with the heavy metals like arsenic and cadmium, zinc. And right. that, that's why uh, it, his body was so, uh, after 36 years, he was still recognizable. Do you have a question for our guest, though? Go ahead, though, because I well, appreciate all that. Well, I just want to say that you know today, in, today you know if, if you're if Paul if Attorney Paul is going to talk about uh, in the future book JFK the JFK assassination, well, you know it, you could say well to allay all these theories about you know single bullets and this and that you could say that well let's exhume JFK, but obviously that would be considered sacrilegious today. Well, let, let's just ask him. We don't we don't have to. He's right here, so let's uh, talk around him. Uh, thanks, Walt. So uh, you had some uh, an interesting reflection on JFK, but what do you think about the idea? There's no dispute that JFK was killed in Dallas. No one's talking about a body no, this, double or anything. Right yeah, now. and the question is, you know, is, uh, you know, was the fa- did the fatal shot come from the front or the back? And we've all seen, you know, and, and thanks to YouTube, we've all seen the Zapruder film. Uh, one of the nice things about YouTube is that, you know, if you, 
you go to the settings, you can actually slow down the video to about 25% speed. And if you watch the um, Zapruder film, um, and, and I actually interviewed a, um, a, a pathologist um, about um, the headshot, and uh, the information that I have is because the head is so dense, it's packed full of gray matter and blood and cerebral fluid and bone and stuff like that, that when a bullet enters the skull, um, a lot of material is displaced. And that displaced material has no place to go until there is an exit wound. So what usually happens is that, is that material squirts out the entry wound. And they call that blowback. And if you look at the Zapruder film, you can clearly see blood extruding from the front of the skull as, 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 the, as the head is snapping back due to the kinetic energy of, of, a, of a bullet coming from the front. Now, there's another film that's, that's even better than the Zapruder film, and it's called the Orville Nix film. There's a lot of controversy surrounding the Orville Nix film. But if you watch the Orville Nix film, which is taken from the opposite side of the street of the Zapruder film, you can actually see this pink cloud the, yeah, screwed from right. the front of the skull, and then travel back across the head, um, and actually see a portion of the brain kind of pop off the back. Um, so, right. uh, again, the question is, where does the bullet? You know, where did the fatal shot come from? Uh, I got two films, you know, taken from two different perspectives that clearly indicate a headshot. I got over 40 witnesses, most of them with military and law enforcement experience, claiming that the gunfire came from the area of the Grassy Knoll or the Triple or the Triple right. Pass. Um, and if you look at the Warren Commission report, very few of those witnesses were called to testify. So is this what you mean when you say you believe you have solved the assassination of JFK? No, um, no. I, I'm referring to uh, a couple of disjointed pieces, and if you'll just kind of bear with me for a second. So there was a lot we of... Still have, just so you know, Paul, there's still other people who want to talk to you, so let's not it, use up all the time, but go ahead. It's impossible for me to be brief, but I'll try. <laughs> I appreciate that so admission. One of, the, one of the big, you know, controversies is that the Warren Commission, although granted tremendous power, was under pressure to wrap up the investigation before the November 1964 presidential election. Um, and People have alluded to the fact that J. Edgar Hoover maintained secret files, and the secret files had damaging information on a number of public figures. Uh, and, and people always claim that, um, that uh, J. Edgar Hoover was basically manipulating Lyndon Johnson to do what he wanted. And I'm not so sure that that's exactly true, because um, right after President Johnson signed the executive order, creating the Warren Commission. About a week later, he signed an executive order that exempted J. Edgar Hoover from mandatory retirement at age 70. Right. Okay. Now, that's number one. Number two, there was some speculation that J. Edgar Hoover might have been, might have been a homosexual. Okay. Uh, and again, this is 1963, you know. Sure. Very, very different. You know, people were very less tolerant of right. alternative lifestyles back then, and that would have been damaging to Hoover. Would it surprise you, Ian, if I, met, if I told you that J. Edgar Hoover and Lyndon Johnson lived across the street from each other in Washington, D.C. for 18 years? Yeah, I didn't think I knew that. No, I knew about Clyde Tolson, but I didn't know about... Well, I mean, but, but, but think about it, okay? We have, yeah. we, we have Lady Bird Johnson basically home most of the day while her husband's right. being a member of Congress and, and, and eventually vice president. Um, she sees Clive, Clyde Tolson show up at Hoover's house at 8 o'clock at night. You see him leave at 6 o'clock in the morning wearing the same clothes, add two and three, right. come up with four. Right. Um, and I think that Lyndon Johnson was blackmailing Hoover. That's your Hoover bomb. That's my Hoover bomb. Okay. Uh, that's very interesting. I mean, you know, uh, uh, that's, very, bombs, that's, a, right? that's very, that's original, dude. I have to say that. And I never would have looped Lady Bird into that, but why not? Well, like I say, I got to blame the wives on occasion. Ah, that's very interesting. All right, west of the Rockies, Neil is in California for Paul DeVoli on Coast to Coast AM. Oh, he did he drop? Uh, he had mentioned that he had a friend um, whose great grandmother was uh, John Wilkes Booth's mother, and I would have loved to have heard more about that because that's kind of cool. Uh, yeah. All right, so let's go to uh, Ton in St. Paul, Minnesota, where I used to hang. Uh, on a wild card line. Go ahead, Ton. 
Uh, good evening, Professor DeBall. My question is, I'm sure you're aware of the similarities slash coincidences between Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy and the assassinations of both. This yes. is a list of over 20. And my question, listening to you, is the possibility that there exists a list of coincidences linking Major James William Boyd and Lee Harvey Oswald. Because if there were, assuming that both were intelligence officers, reportedly both were involved with the intelligence community in one way or another, both yeah. uh, could be patsies, and had there been similarities between Booth and Lee Harvey Oswald, that would have come up a long time ago, but I'm suggesting that if they were both patsies, that a pattern of similarities of whatever cosmic origin may exist. Have you considered that at all? I have not considered, and, and, and quite frankly, I know a good idea when I steal one, so that's something I'll be... I'll, I'll, <laughs> some later on. No, I mean, it's, it's really no, interesting, it's good. The, the, the overlap between the intelligence agencies. I uh, just want to throw one other thing out there about about, uh, about Oswald. Is, uh, in, in his book, Jim Mars, uh, in his book, Crossfire, Jim Mars yeah. actually reproduces a copy of um, um, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's medical records. Uh, from the Marine Corps, and in the medical records, he finds that uh, um, Oswald came down with a sexually transmitted disease. I'm not sure if it was syphilis or gonorrhea or whatever. And the doctor makes the notation on his medical record that the disease was duty related. Hmm. What the heck kind of duty do you have to be involved in where you come down with a sexually transmitted disease unless you are an intelligence officer? No, that's very interesting. Uh, first time caller line, Joe is in Queens on Coast to Coast AM. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, hi, Ian. Uh, great show, guys. Thanks a lot. Um, are you there? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, I've heard two questions. I'm going to pull Joe from the line. i got two quick questions. First of all, I always heard there was a, a Canadian connection to this assassination. And also, um, um, I heard a story from another Coast to Coast guest that uh, – Lincoln had a son named Robert that almost died on a train where he fell in between cars or fell on the tracks and was pulled to safety by a stranger, and the stranger was John Wilspook. I thought it was John Wilspook, but... Uh, no, 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 but you're getting close. Edwin Booth. He almost yeah. fell off a train platform in, uh, yeah. uh, in New York City, and Edwin Years Booth later. grabbed him and saved him. But the interesting thing about Robert Todd Lincoln is that Robert Todd Lincoln was at the train station when President Garfield was assassinated. Oh, another interesting historical Garfield, coincidence. Secretary of War, and he was supposed to, and, and quite frankly, just before President McKinley was assassinated, he was on his way to a, uh, to, to to meet Robert Todd Lincoln about some uh, about some confidential matter. So let me just be clear with that, just so Joe caught that. So it was after the assassination, and it was Booth's brother, who, as I I heard it described, like grabbed. Um, Robert Todd Lincoln by the collar and pulled falling into the platform. Yeah. Right. He'd become distracted and the train was coming in faster and he pulled him back to keep him from falling in. Yeah, my understanding it was before the assassination. Oh, really? I don't think I thought that was years later. You know, interesting, uh, interesting thing is that two of Booth's brothers, both Edwin and um, Junius, are actually buried probably about 15 miles from where I'm sitting right now. How about uh, that? Huge Massachusetts Booth connection. Um, so then Joe is in Long Island. We go from Joe from Queens, to Joe from Long Island. Joe, we got to be quick here. We're running out of time. Yeah. What well, was Booth's mother still alive uh, at, at the time? This was, uh, you know, after the escape or other relatives or friends that he attempted to recontact? Uh, the mother was alive. Uh, his brothers were alive. I think one died in the 1880s, one died in the 1890s. Uh, and as far as we can tell, there was no attempt to um, to contact them. Now, there there is a story about a, a, a preacher who lived outside of Atlanta. Uh, his name escapes me at the moment, who bore an uncanny resemblance to John Wilkes Booth. And there is some evidence that Edwin Booth met with this preacher and traveled to meet with him several times. Uh, but that's pretty much anecdotal and, 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 and really not supported by the historical record. So, Well, you've done a great job in supporting uh, the historical record, I think, uh, tonight with what you have been asserting. I think you've used available information. And like a good attorney, you've also been very clear about not saying that something was more credible than it was, um, which only adds to 
your credibility. I really enjoyed that. I look forward to hearing more about your book when it comes out. Thank you for giving us that Hoover bomb. That was novel, and I'm going to be sorting that out. Lady Bird in on, <laughs> in on the deal with, with Jay Edgar. And I will tell you, I will look forward to having you back on anytime you get closer, or we've got the uh, History Channel special coming up. Thank you so much to everybody who is. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody out there who is listening. Um, estranged, not estranged, people who have loved their mothers, people who have trouble with their mothers. Maybe tomorrow's a truce day. Uh, I don't know. I throw that out there as a. I'm preaching a little bit, but maybe there's a day you try a little bit more uh, and make sure that you at least let her know that you're grateful you're on the planet. Uh, and if you have a great relationship with your mother, have a great day tomorrow. And if you are a mother, happy Mother's Day from all of us from Coast to Coast AM. Deus te amat. And I do too.